Hi, welcome to Tal Radio English. I am Rajeshwari Kalyanam, your host. We have with us Ms. Lina Mukherjee, relational trauma psychotherapist, menopause and mental health researcher and counselor. And today we will be speaking to her about menopause in career women. Thank you so much, Lina, for coming here for the third time. And uh, there's there cannot be enough that we can speak about this. There, <laughs> we there's so much more that we have to sp- talk about. So I'm so glad you're here. And thank you for inviting me back because I think you're absolutely right that we could talk endlessly about this subject because it affects every woman on the planet. So there's lots to share. Absolutely. So I was just reading this article of uh, it's called Menopause and its Impact on Working Women. This is in the Atlanta Journal Constitution where they've researched on 1000 women and uh, four in 10 women said mon- menopause symptoms interfered with their work on a weekly basis. It interfered with their performance and productivity and two in 10 said it interfered with them daily and multiple times sometimes in a day. So um What are these mental and physical symptoms that perhaps are affecting these women? And uh, what are the various ways that they can affect uh, the career women as in the women at workplace? Yeah, good and and fascinating research, isn't it? Well, the fact that what it's saying is that so many, so many women are affected. That's number one. And then we have these symptoms. And basically down, it's down to the, the, the change of hormones within the within the body and it's how the brain and our nervous system are affected so you have a usually in in a fully functioning woman before menopause there's a fantastic balance that's happening within the brain in terms of our hormones that keeps everything functioning and allows us to be fertile to be functioning well and during those perimenopause and menopause years Sorry, things start to change. So as our estrogen drops, our brain, which is an, an estrogen producer, starts to get really affected. So these symptoms that women are experiencing are as a consequence of the whole significant hormonal changes. So we can experience pain. Pain is the big one because estrogen is a fantastic um, emollient against pain. So when that drops, we start to ache more. Our temperature gets affected. So we start getting hot flushes because our part of the brain that regulates temperature is affected. And we start to feel irritated. Our blood sugar levels are going up and down like mad because our insulin is affected because of this change. There's a phenomenal amount. And on top of that, we our world that we used to know as feeling safe and routine and everything worked starts to really become change what we feel is out of our control. So it is understandable for career women who I'm I'm assuming I'm on myself has to keep all routine going. So there's lots of different plates and spinning plates women are having to to manage in order to maintain their career and home life and their own health and often women put their own health last so it makes it even harder to be as productive as creative as ambitious and pushing when you're absolutely tired because your brain is changing and actually our available energy to the brain drops by 30 percent so actually we are having to work harder with less energy available so it's a tough deal it's a really tough deal. So uh, there is something called the negative stereotyping. And uh, hmm. that is definitely there in the workplace when we talk about periods uh, on period leave that we, we see a lot of that coming about. Yeah. Uh, are women in this such a scenario ready to talk about uh, these problems, especially the career women in their workplace? What do well, you see? Well, certainly here, uh, Rajwar, in the UK, there's a very big movement. It's happened in the last two years in particular where th- this very question about raising issues around your periods, about the pain and, and actually the discomfort and with menopause, it, it, and what I'm assuming with the question you're raising that within India, it's, it's, it's still um, fighting against the, the pay, I'll say patriarchy, the norm that actually women's issues are to be hidden. They're, they're, they're almost dirty, they're, they're not important. And yes, they are important because if we're expecting career women to be on par with men, there needs to be some parity. So the negative stereotyping, we need to question who are the people that are 
portraying these images of women not being efficient, these measures, who, who's, who's staying, saying that? Because you can't compare, it's not like with like here. I think that's what we say. We need to bring these considerations into, into now, which is what we're talking about, to say, to make it much more equal and fair because men do not have the same sorts of physical issues that women go through in menopause. It's different. And that needs to be taken into yes. consideration. Yeah. So uh, when I mean negative stereotyping, it's also in the fact that, let's say, uh, menopause uh, in women uh, arrives at around 50. And when we talk about career women, and if they are consistently at their career trying to reach the top, mm -hmm. that is the time when they're trying for mm -hmm. the senior positions that is yes. the time when they're dealing with politics that is the time when they're yes. dealing with a lot of men also trying to uh, yeah. reach the position and we talk about not many women reaching uh, breaking the glass ceiling and we talk about a lot of women quitting their careers much before they've reached there so that's the reason all over the world when you look at the people on the top yes the, there are less a number of women so in yes. this scenario is when uh these issues when we talk about them in workplace may affect adversely is what women perceive mostly so in this scenario, what is the kind of uh, counseling you would give to them? What is the kind of uh, message that you would like to give to them? And how can they deal with it? And how do they approach it? Okay, so first of all, a very, very good question, Rajvari, and I'm really glad you've raised it. The number one thing I would invite all women, please listen to me, is acknowledge what is happening for you. And when I say what's happening for you, how you're feeling, the, the, the hurdles and battles you're having to fight in order to be accepted. The key thing is, is about finding information out and other women, because that's the only way when we group together as a, as a community, can we stand together as a united force? And there are many of us who are campaigning, but we're in isolated pockets. So number one, really accept that what you're going through is the reality you cannot compare or, or judge yourself, it's easier said than done, I know, that you are somehow inferior, less than, because you're just not getting there or you've just not done well enough. Well, hang on a minute. Every day you are having to battle with, with unseen things. And it's so in terms of not being able to talk about it. So it's about finding information, finding other women. And there's lots of literature in women's groups, particularly in the UK. Contact me. You know, you, you'll have my details and then I can get you in, in touch with resources and also start campaigning, you know, use Twitter, use Facebook, not in a negative way to slam and blame. It's about raising awareness that as a woman, I think I'm doing really well with actually dealing with what I have to and being successful. And you're right. You know, when women hit 50, we're tired. And then having to put more energy in to prove our worth, there needs to be some slack. So employers, so big companies need to open their doors, their eyes and their ears to listening to how can they support these fantastic, talented women who have worked so hard. We want to help them stay in the workplace and retain the talent because all that experience you cannot buy. You can't. Life experience and work experience, no. So what, what policies need to be changed from employers' perspectives to retain and support these women so they can progress their careers? It's not inferiority or the fact they're lacking. It's because they need different support mechanisms to help them. So we have fairness. So women start campaigning, start saying, but grouping together is rather than on your own, because on your own, you feel like you're targeted. But the first thing to start with is own your own experience. And it's valid. And, and get in touch. Let's start campaigning. That's very important. I think you're doing it together as, as a system. Absolutely. So that is one of my later questions and about sisterhood and how we can do it together. So before that, can I also ask you about how do women deal with it? Uh, evidently, that is one way, one way psychologically dealing with it is talking about it mm -hmm. and talking about your peers. So what, how do they deal with it uh, health wise? Uh, mm -hmm. You have campaigned to say that it is definitely treatable. It can be addressed and there are a lot of good results that come out of it. If you address it instead of not talk about it. Oh. So please tell us about that. Okay. And, and again, a very good question. Right. My attitude to menopause is, is about using it the process, because it's you know over a 10 year process that our bodies are changing to use it as an opportunity as part of our growing 
personal development, our professional development, and our spiritual development. Who am I as a woman? So instead of trying to fix the problem that it's menopause is a problem, it's not. It's a natural phase of a woman's growth process. So basically, it's, it's reframing how we view menopause. So all these symptoms often is because of this dysregulation in the body because of the hormonal changes that affect every cell in our body and every organ. So instead of fighting or judging or labeling uh, uh, there's something wrong no 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 let's reframe it to say there's a rebalance it's like the sea when it's very very turbulent we wait until it finds its equilibrium and there's lots of things we can do to help our own self rather than go to the doctor and get a pill or, or a, a, a drug no 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 it's a natural process so let's think about diet diet's one of the big ones to cut down your any stresses on that affect your body so sugar caffeine nicotine alcohol they are the big ones that affect our sugar um experiences and how we you know how that perpetuates almost to stimulate anxiety so we want to bring our sugar levels down so there's a lot more um equilibrium in terms of our blood sugar levels exercise is the num next number one Thing because as we get older, our bone density decreases. So the key thing is we can't re we can't go back to our youth, but what we can do is sustain our strength and our flexibility by movement. The key thing is the body needs to move. It's also absolutely important for our circulation and our heart because as we get older through menopause, we become sluggish because everything's starting to slow down. We also retain more fat. Fat we need because it holds estrogen, but there's a level of fat that then becomes adverse to the body. The next thing is also about your breathing. Breathing is the most immediate thing you can alter. And often if we're not breathing well, that exacerbates our anxiety and depression because it's the breath that holds our oxygen that we need, that our brain is. Our brain needs more input because, as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's operating at 30 percent lower um, energy wise because of the literally the, the hormonal changes. So we need to be moving. We need to be breathing better. We need to be eating better and hydrated. You need to drink loads of water, at least a, a liter and a half every day which in India you're going to be anyway but certainly in the west that's a challenge but cut your caffeine down your tea your coffee saturated fat because they are poison to the body and those are the things you can do in your everyday life and it makes a difference you're looking at someone or hearing someone who went through a horrendous time with two menopauses and with those they really helped Go seek a good yoga class out to help you to still the mind. It's not to, to stop the mind, but it's helping you to regulate emotionally and hormonally. They go a long way. And those you can do. Wonderful. I, wonderful. I think I would like to uh, also elaborate on one small point there, though there's a lot more you could elaborate. But I would <laughs> like to talk about uh, the breathing. I mean, that's something I've heard often when the, when women go to doctors they are told about breathing what are we doing wrong what can we do right okay good question well having been a yoga teacher for 20 over 25 years Rajaswari and and actually watching working with so many menopausal women and postmenopausal women over the years what I have observed is that when we're anxious our breathing becomes very shallow and we're only breathing into the collarbones. That's what ends up happening. So like, <laughs> we don't even know that we're doing that because when we're anxious, we're disconnected from the body. So with the breath, what I will encourage your listeners to consider is listen to the breath at the moment, literally to tune into their breathing as, you're, as they're listening to me and you. And where are they breathing? Because I want you to deepen the breath so at least you can feel your tummy, your stomach, your abdomen moving. Because the deeper we breathe, that means we're taking more oxygen into more of our lung area. We need to take deeper breaths to fill our lungs. And that is the energy we need. It's also the breathing out. And when we look at um, pranayama practice, the emphasis is on the exhalation as opposed to the inhalation. Because the exhalation basically is that part of the breathing process that removes toxins in the form of carbon dioxide from the body. 
because otherwise we get a, an imbalance between the oxygen and the carbon dioxide in our blood. And the more, the less we take in oxygen and the more CO2 there is, the more acidic blood gets and that exacerbates our anxiety. So we can help ourselves by taking a slower, deeper breath in and an even slower, deeper breath out and it makes the difference. And if we slow down the breath and deepen it, our mind gets affected. Patanjali's famous quote in, in the sutras is yoga, shittas, nirudha. Sorry, yoga, shittas, vritti, nirudha. Yoga is the stilling of the thought ways of the mind. And it does. And if you pra practice that as part of your pranam in the morning, your puja, for five minutes, and then at midday, and then in the evening, your life will change. You really will. I have taught thousands of women this. I literally have. And I have seen very, very sick, literally chronically ill and, and end of life uh, students and, and clients work with this. And it was a gift to see the difference it can make. And it does. You just got to do it. <laughs> amazing, amazing. And it is not very difficult to. I think that's a definite is something which you can easily adapt. Yet another thing I was wanting to talk to you about is the stress in career women. Yeah. And I have read that um, one is, of course, when you're reaching menopause, you have problems. But uh, I've read that there is stress in workplace. And if women take on the stress upon themselves, it will hasten the process of menopause. Yes. And it will bring the problems much earlier than they usually do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a, a little bit about that part of the question and also if there is anything else that women can do to prepare themselves for the inevitable yeah. <laughs> lovely it's a good question so what i'm i hear you're alluding to um rajasvari is the role of adrenaline and cortisol in the body because when we are stressed we don't often know that we are because it becomes a way of life and when you feel really sort of excited or um, feel like you're out for a fight that literally is because you are your body's prepared through adrenaline release that you are pumping yourself up and if that adrenaline is not used and it stays within the system it has really negative effects on your heart on your digestive system and also like you say on your hormone because it's hormones what adrenaline is um it affects your your cycle and it affects your your literally it will speed up as you rightly said your menopause process because it's interfering again with that equilibrium it's adding to the mix to make things even more turbulent but then you throw in cortisol which which again is released it's it's a natural inflammator inflammatory anti-inflammatory um, agent for the healing process but what happens then is that when we're stressed and there's excess cortisol it then affects your immune system. So you start getting more colds, you start picking up more bugs, that you start having more tummy aches or tummy problems, stomach problems. And so our health starts to be really affected and you can't get out the cycle. So the key thing is, again, is to reduce, first of all, become aware that you're stressed. If you feel yourself pumping up or you're starting to avoid, that's the fight and flight. So if you catch yourself doing that, which is why we need to cut down on the caffeine, because that adds to the stress and release of adrenaline. You feel your heart pumping, slow down. Those are the things you can do. Stop walking so fast. Stop thinking so fast. Take a moment to stop and slow down. That then affects the, the literally the imbalance to find that equilibrium within your being again and it's awareness it, it's only you can do it as an individual because your system's different from mine but it's it's making the commitment to notice to be responsive rather than reactive that's the reframing that you are the the pilot on your own plane that's your body you are the captain of your own ship where you are steering the ship rather than feeling I'm just being hit by wave after wave. If you change your frame of reference, it makes a huge difference. It takes time and it will take a lot of goings, but it's the commitment. And there's many of us who have gone through in that process and are here. I, I'm sitting here today as a product of this and it's trial and error, but you will get more success if you keep going and seek out resources because there's loads online to support breathing practices ways of being that will help including my my youtube channel so i also asked you about is there a way a woman can 
to their life prepare themselves for the 50s. yes yes there is knowledge information knowledge there's some really good literature out there about what you need to do and first of all really start looking at your diet diet plays a massive part and you need to be looking at this at least 10 years before so cut out your saturated fat you want to cut down on i keep saying the sugar so all those mishtis start saying no start to sup use supplements where appropriate so um the oils the the omega-3 oils your cod liver oil your evening primrose oil getting your digestion sorted we've got so many beautiful uh, natural herbs through ayurveda where you start to strengthen your digestive system and your immune system as well use them use as natural as possible and all this will start to help to build your system up so you've got strength so those are the things i would be definitely an exercise exercise to build up your your bone density and your flexibility to keep things moving those are the two things your diet and your exercise and your sleep because that will also your sleep will get affected because hormonally um it creates these imbalances in the, in the way we do sleep because it just does, it affects the brain, those centers of the brain that are um, part of what manages our sleep. So it's taking all those measures beforehand and read, go find out information. There's some really good literature, some books. The, the key one that helped me was a book called The Wisdom of Menopause by Dr. Christiane Northrop. It was a godsend. It was the Bible for me to help me. And that really supported me through being able to do things in order to prepare. So I would definitely recommend that. Can you uh, tell us about any of the misconceptions, uh, any of the um, misconceptions that people have mostly uh, about menopause? When you speak to people, are there in, uh, any that come very often to you and you would like to take this podcast as a platform to talk about them? Absolutely. I think the big one for me, and it's a, a recurring theme, is that the fear of becoming like an old hag, a, a dried out, grey haired, ugly witch. That's that's often the image that I'm no longer attractive. I'm no longer wanted. I'm no longer seen. Those are the fears and the misconceptions. Absolutely, because women comes into come into her wisdom or come into their wisdom as you get older. There's something very beautiful that can happen <clears throat> as a consequence of the menopausal process as you're leaving one chapter of life, as you're entering into those wisdom years. And I really challenge those misconceptions and they they go back to a lot of patriarchal thinking that because women are no longer fertile, they're no longer virile, they're no longer able to to have create life, that their purpose is over. Well, that's rubbish, because actually a woman, when we look at our our goddesses, whether it's Durga, whether it's Kali, whether it's um, Sharashadi, you know, that is when that energy comes through. When we look at it archetypally, it's the wisdom years that we can really come into our power. And that's very challenging to a society that puts women in an inferior position. Because it is. It, it, you know, you, you, we, we learn in those first 50 years of life to adapt. We're very good as a, um, as a gender to to comply and to be the housemaker the good girl the good wife etc and then something happens when you wake up and go hang on a minute where's the fairness in this i have something to say i have something to contribute and i got a brain and i'm clever and i can see what's going on that i can make a difference that i'm challenging that misconception that it's not a time of decline yes it is in terms of physically we're changing but certainly not in your sense of spirit and who you are as a person and that's why i do the work i do as we discussed earlier i also read it at many places that there's not enough research medically being done on senior women on menopause uh, we do have some papers around uh, in, on internet but still i feel uh, that because I, of what I read, there isn't enough. What is your perception uh, of it when I say that there isn't enough research that's being done medically on senior women and on menopause? Absolutely right. There isn't enough. When you when you look at the, the focus of where such research is, 
it's all about how women perceive menopause. A lot of that is to do with perception and, and looking sociologically at, at women's impact, but nothing more. And there is so little, which, so little research ref reflects at the moment society's um, valuing of menopause and more needs to be done. Absolutely, because to me, menopause is an empowerment process, but I have not seen that enough coming through. It's more about what, what's wrong. And because of that, there's very little change or ideas of implementing ways to support women. And actually, because the actual uh, framing of it is, is, in a, is in an adverse way to a woman, whereas actually a lot of positive, what I call that growth, isn't being promoted. And that's where I'm coming in with my ideas and my ideas for research, which is very exciting. It's challenging the, the, the negative perceptions because not enough is being done to challenge the existing status quo. That's amazing because I just was caught on that one word. It is empowering. I mean, that's something very new I've heard that uh, the period of menopause is empowering rather mm -hmm. than uh, 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 the, the problem areas because uh, I think whatever we've heard or uh, whatever I, even I perceive is about the problems and how mm -hmm. we deal with it. Mm. But you've said empowering, but mm. that was very interesting. Could you elaborate on that? Oh, absolutely. So for me, Rajeshwari, I'm informed in two ways, both personally, my own personal experience with menopause and my own growth, and also professionally. And if we look back to Indian culture, this is really generalizing that often the perception is when you hit 50, you start to reassess your life. You've done the householder life and you turn towards a more spiritual life. So life becomes simpler as you start to focus inward. It's a natural progression. Start looking at self and, and actually how you develop spiritually. OK, if we apply that to the natural process that our own body is going through, because that's what it's doing. It's, it's like shutting down those areas of life that we're no longer externalizing our energy and we're out there making a difference in the world. But something else is going alongside, which is about developing our internal life, our inner self, and what Carl Jung called the individuation process. Likewise, menopause for me is the individuation process that as I as a person in my own right, it's about coming to terms with what's happened in my life and sorting unfinished business so whether that's a grieving process, whether it's about injustices, dealing with my anger, why am I so angry? Where have I been let down? Where have I been, um, where have I been taken advantage of? Sorting that out. And that's why as a therapist, I work with a lot of clients to, to make sense of life, to then reach a point where I am content. I know who I am, what's important for me, my values, my beliefs, what I'm good at. And actually, what do I want to learn? This is another phase of life where you get all that, those 50 years of life experience to then inform you about where you want to put your energy next. That's the empowerment bit, because you start to realize you have so many skills, so many dreams, so many ideas that stimulate your learning, your growth, your development. And it doesn't stop, you know, the human brain doesn't stop learning or growing. And that to me is such an exciting um, prospect because as women, when we come into our power, we start to affect the world around us and, and actually how we can start to make the world a better place. And it, and it does because we can influence our, our work environments by having that wisdom having that elders position where we are advising and mentoring women coming through and young men coming through that, you know, you're saying I represent all these years of work and I'm here and I can support you now. And at the same time, empowering myself to believe that what I am is, is pretty good because I have fought my way and, and managed all those hurdles and I'm here. So it's about contributing to society and making it a better place as well as your own internal life, being a much more contented, settled and growthful life and very enriching.
So that's why I say it's empowering. That's amazing. And that would have been a great ending to this podcast if I didn't have another question for you. So there's just one more question. I, uh, you have spoken about the collective voices which always work for women. I mean, we've always been able to convey more, gain more strength out of collective voices. And uh, interestingly, it happens across the world. I mean, the whole world over women are having one voice on certain issues. Yeah. So for menopause, is there any sisterhood organization? Are there any collective communities like this? Uh, of course, we talk to our friends, but the, are there any oh. communities where they can kind of join and interact with others? Ah. Any Facebook groups? There are. I mean, that's where we need to search because I don't know what's happening in, in India. But when I'm and that's probably to, to find out on Facebook. And often if you look at menopause matters or menopause women, that may bring up groups in the UK, it's slowly forming. It's it's very much about symptom focused, how we can get through. So there's lots of uh, groups that advise and help, but as a collective voice, no, I don't think there is enough yet. It's happening in very small pockets, but I can't name enough here, Rajaswari, to say to you, right, It's we don't have a Me Too movement yet. And I guess where I'm coming from is that I'd like to start one up. And, and hopefully through this podcast, if women are willing to get in touch with me, then I'm going to obviously share my ideas more on. I, I, I do tweet, um, but that's going to become more formalized soon. So that's where we're at. So perhaps it's time for a revolution. What do you think? <laughs> Definitely. Def this is definitely, I think that the, the time has come when we have to yeah. talk about it, normalize it feel the power within ourselves yeah. as you very rightly said and do it together yes but that way i think it's going to become stronger yes. that way organizations are going to listen to us and yep. workplaces definitely will become better for career women in yes. menopause Absolutely. i i do hope so too yes. thank you so much it was one of the best conversations i've ha had uh, right. amazing uh, and uh, very informative thank you so much lena my great pleasure and thank you fellow sister <laughs> There, the sisterhood starts. Exactly. <laughs> See you. Thank you so much. Thank you.